Now this is a quick message for anyone who is an illustrator or for someone who's thinking about getting into product design illustration. If you want to know how to do a box art, learn from the masters because this is how you box art. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 135th scale M60A1 main battle tank. This model here was built for commission and belongs to a private collector. Like I often mention in these build videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. This model here is built predominantly out of the box, however, has been upgraded in both detail as well as with functionality. We'll be going over all of these additions as well as reviewing the base starter kit in this video. So stay tuned because there's going to be a lot of info coming at you. Well, let's start things off by taking a quick walk around this model. And this vehicle here is the ubiquitous M60A1 main battle tank. For anyone wondering, this vehicle was the mainstay of the US Armored Corps from the mid-1960s and served all the way up until its retirement in the mid-1990s. In a nutshell, these vehicles were designed with lessons and design cues that were learned and approved upon from the M48 patent family. The two vehicles aesthetically have a lot of similarities to them. They both utilize an all-cast bathtub hull. They both utilize a similar torsion bar suspension with external shock absorbers for extra rigidity. They both utilize an all-cast turret, and the M60 borrowed, or I should say was influenced from the M48 A3, with being a diesel-powered vehicle. Unlike the M48, which was originally intended to use a gasoline engine, the M60 from the get-go was using a turbo diesel engine. The M60 would keep this engine all the way up until the end of its service life with the US military. Many of the other fittings were also backwards compatible, namely the components which would commonly need to be replaced in field. These would include the majority of the running gear, such as the track, sprocket, and even the road wheels. Although on the M48 the road wheels were stamped steel, and on the M60 originally they were intended to utilize an all new wheel design made from cast aluminum. The cast aluminum wheels were thought to be an improvement because they saved on overall weight of the vehicle. Having said that, the M60, it's not uncommon to see these vehicles with the aluminum wheels replaced with just your standard stamped steel wheels, which were basically identical to the ones found on the M48 series. Where the M60 was really more improved from the 48 was really with the geometry of the hull as well as the turret. The M48 utilized a blunt frog nose type nose, while on the M60 they went with a more pike sharp edge type format. This was deemed to give better ballistics for incoming rounds from the front of the vehicle. The vehicle's turret, the M60A1 specifically, had the needle nose type pattern, which again gives for better ballistic protection. One major improvement from the M48 to the M60, however, was with the firepower. The M48 always utilized for a majority of its life the 90mm gun, however with the advancement in Soviet armor technology and design, this was deemed to not have as much effectiveness as it did when the M48 was originally developed in the 50s. The M60 on the other hand was going to utilize the NATO standard L7 105mm rifled gun. With this new gun, the vehicle was going to have adequate firepower with dealing with the majority of the Russian tanks which were being fielded and were on the drawing board at that time. Apart from the main gun, the other armament changes which were arguably a step backward was for the 50 caliber machine gun on the M48 utilized ubiquitous M2HB in a little mini commander's cupola turret while the M60 kept the mini cupola turret idea but the M2 was replaced with the M85. For the vehicle's coaxial armament, the M48 utilized an improved version of the M1919 Browning, while the M60 was going to utilize the brand new M73 machine gun for this role. 
Just like with the M48, the M60 utilized a over-the-gun mounted Xenon searchlight. The device was the exact same unit and was another one of those backwards compatible items. The M60, like I said before, was in service for a really good chunk of time and it's deemed to be one of the more successful tank designs post World War II. With 30 years of experience with the US military, the vehicle is still in service as of the date of this video with several other countries in the world today. Over the years, the tank design has proven to be a very adaptable platform. With this in mind, many of the countries that utilize this vehicle have developed aftermarket and upgrade packages to keep this vehicle relevant for the foreseeable future. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when this model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this Tamiya vintage re-release of the M60A1 medium tank. Now this is a kit that I've been wanting to get my hands on for a little while now. Now for the quick background, the Tamiya M60A1 kit is one of those classic model kits that was hugely influential and is still with us today in albeit a modified state. This kit here was originally released by Tamiya back in 1970. This was along the lines one of Tamiya's second generation model kits. Their first generation kits date back to the mid 1960s and from there they went ahead and improved their tooling and some of the newer kits that were dropping was the Panther Alpha A and also this M60. This model here was originally designed first and foremost to be a motorized model kit and you're going to see that once I crack the box open. Now, at the time of release, Tamiya offered this kit in two flavors. The first flavor is what we have here, and this rendition of the kit would have utilized a box very similar to this one with this very beautiful and exquisite box art. And when I mean beautiful box art, I definitely mean it. The 1970s time period is when the Japanese model kits in particular had just their A game with their illustrators. This is true for not just Tamiya, but also brands as Nichimo and Bandai, not to mention Fujimi. All of these Japanese kit companies, the box arts of the period, if you ask anybody, will tell you we're just above and beyond what you would see normally. Now, in addition to this gorgeous box art, what you would also get was the model with a two-way wire remote control. The gearbox would have two motor drive, and that would go via a long wire to a handheld little remote that held the batteries and from there you can actually drive the model and actually play with it. Now that's with this rendition. The other rendition of the kit was a little bit simpler. It utilized the classic Tamiya white box background, had the graphic of the vehicle in the foreground, which again the illustration was actually pretty good but nothing compared to what we have here. And that kit was designed to be single motorized where you have a one motor gearbox where you just drop in two C batteries inside of the tank. There's a built-in switch. You hit it one direction, the model goes forward. And if you go the other direction with the switch, the model goes in reverse. That rendition of the kit can also be built in a static form, but seriously, why would you want to do that? Because part of the charm of these old Tamiya kits of the period was the motorization aspect of it. Now Tamiya did this for a period of time throughout the 1970s, but in the 1980s they decided to start trimming off their catalog and the dual motor gearbox kits regrettably were axed in favor of the white box. Now the white box kits were still being offered. However, again, towards this point here, you start seeing to me a phase away from the motorized aspect and just went straight into the static only rendition of their kits. Again, it's the exact same kit, but without the motorization equipment and electronics that are included. Now the M60A1 was in full production with Tamiya for a number of years. Up until the mid 1980s, Tamiya decided to upgrade the kit's tooling because at this point here, the kit's technology was really starting to show its age. And compared to what newer tooling that was available at the time, the kit was in due for a bit of 
the facelift. And Tamiya did that, and that kit was the Tamiya M60A3. What Tamiya went ahead and did was they took the base tooling from this kit here and polished it up, improving some mistakes that were found on the original tooling of the M60A1, but also changing out some of the other components for other type of parts which would be more relevant for the M60A3. Now that kit was also in production for a period of time, but unlike the earlier releases, it was exclusively sold as a static model kit. Fast forward to post Gulf War period in the 1990s, Tamiya went ahead and stopped production on the A3 kit and gave the vehicle yet another facelift. This time, the vehicle was sold as a US Marine Corps M60A1, capitalizing on the M60s used by the US Marine Corps during the first Gulf War. In addition to that, they also went ahead and tooled up a separate runner full of the ERA explosive reactive armor panels. And this version of the M60 has been in production with Timia really ever since. Now, that's not the end of the story for this kit, because in the late 1980s and exactly in 1990, there was this other small startup plastic model company from Seoul, South Korea. This company goes by the name of Academy. Well, around this time, they wanted to tool up some 135th scale plastic model kits, but tooling up your own kits is actually a very costly endeavor. So they had the idea of simply taking existing Tamiya kits and just reverse engineering them and producing them themselves. In 1990, they released their rendition of the M60A1. Only their kit featured a few other additions and modifications compared to the stock Tamiya unit. Some of the additions would be a different Xenon searchlight, as well as they too developed their own explosive reactive armor add-on armor runner sets. Now, outside of that, Academy also went ahead and polished up some of the other areas on the Tamiya kit, which Tamiya left from the original 1970 release, theoretically making the Academy kit slightly more improved compared to the Tamiya rendering. And basically, it's the Tamiya's tooling at its final form, so to speak. Now, enough with the South Korean variant. When it comes back to the good old Japanese version, Tamiya kept their U.S. Marine Corps M60A1 in full production, basically even up till today. So a good 20 years of production status, which is nothing to sneeze at. However, by 2013, Tamiya decided, and it was actually a really good idea, to, well, revisit many of their classic kits that really were no longer in production for a number of years. Now, Tamiya does do this from time to time. They'll re-release vintage kits on a whim, like their, like their vintage Matilda or their M62 Starship. And well, in 2013, they went ahead and re-released their M60 A1. But unlike many of their other re-releases, which were generally the white box format, for this variant here, they wisely chose to re-vigor the old beautiful box art like we have here. Now, this kit here was supplied by the customer. He purchased it a number of years ago and has been sitting basically in his collection ever since. And he told me he did not want to touch this build because he loved the, the box art. It reminded him of the kits that he used to build back in the army that were being sold at the PX. Although he specifically said they were the white box pattern compared to this variant here. Now, for a while, these kits were actually pretty prolific. As we all know, Tamiya does have some very good distribution, and these kits were being sold literally everywhere online, from eBay to Amazon. And they were sold for, well, relatively average prices, anywhere between 30 to 40 US dollars. Well, recently I went ahead and checked the prices of these re-releases here, and they have risen astronomically in price. It has been a number of years since these kits were released, and now these kits themselves are collector's items in themselves. By the way, the original version with this box art with the two-way two wire remote, be prepared to spend a lot of money on. Those kits always fetch in buco bucks just because of their rarity and for their collector status. Those original kits retail anywhere from 150 to about 300 US dollars. So. If you're going to buy one of those kits, don't build it, just keep it as an investor piece and just keep it original. It's just, it's one of those things that's really hard to do, honestly, because I have a few of my own collection and they do beckon to be built and be built well, but they just, it, 
It's kind of like the Ark of the Covenant. You don't want to touch it. <laughs> now, although these kits have increased in value at the time of filming, I went ahead and tried to look online at their prices, and they retail around 70 to 80 US dollars. And I've even seen one guy try to sell for 120, which, in my opinion, the guy's really price gouging. Now, I'm curious when I crack open this box, I don't know what's inside of it. Obviously, it's gonna be a Tamiya M60A1 kit, but I'm not sure if Tamiya is cool enough to give you the two-way wire remote system or if it's just a static kit that is just wrapped in a pretty box art. But since it's still wrapped in the shrink wrap, this is going to be discovered by all of us during this video. Now, with my handy-dandy steak knife, I'm gonna go ahead and crack this box open so we get a good idea on what the base kit is. Now, I'm gonna be careful, I don't wanna do any damage to the box itself. All right, we're, we're committed now, <laughs> it's official. All right, with that out of the way, let's go ahead and take a quick look first at the graphic design because this box art really really demands it. Now, here we have the M60A1, obviously late 60s, early 1970s, all in its dark olive drab configuration with its markings all laid out. Now, all of these vintage box arts really have a scene and but, you know, by and large most like artworks you see have some kind of a scene like a tank driving on the road or a bombed out city or and a lot of times some action, but these old Japanese box arts, they really take it to the nth degree. One thing I always liked about them is that you get to see a lot of the painterly brush strokes, but yet at the same time the renditions are extremely detailed. And you can see that here on the running gear, the tracks, as well as also the little finer details like the red painted fire extinguisher, little grab handles, even the gypsy rack has its mesh rendered in. Now the scene itself depicts this M60A1 that's Looks like he's just parked over here, giving cover for the other M60s, which are actually fording this river that's directly behind it. Note this M60 has its snorkel extended over the turret while it's plowing through the, the river. And this one here is still drenched with water emerging from the riverbed. We have a tank commander here looking backward, just checking everything out. And again, everything is beautifully rendered. You can even see the patch for the armor division insignia on his sleeve. Again, these box arts, they just, <laughs> they always do make me smile. Now the rest of the graphic design is as follows. Now this type of layout here is very similar to what you would have found on the original 1970 release, but the verbiage is slightly different. Obviously you have a little bit more I should say legal information on this side over here. And I do not see anything about the two-way wire remote function that would be front and present right here along this little section here of the header. To me a logo, of course. Rest of the graphic design, we have, oh, look at that. It's the white background version of the M60. And here we have a quick verbiage of the vehicle in question. This is also slightly different compared to the original. I believe on the original you would also have a section of this written in English, if I'm not mistaken. Here we have the Tamiya information. Now, a quick way to tell if this is an original versus if it's the re-release, because you might run to a shyster out there that might try to pass this one off as the original, is, you know, first use your head. Like I said in the Panther video, check to see if the white is yellowing. If it's bleach white like you see here, obviously it might be too good to be true. Also, the stock of the cardboard, some about the older kits, they just feel different. They're, they're more robust, they're thicker, chunkier in their overall appearance, and this box here really just feels like a modern to me a box art, or you know, box structure I should say. Also, you have this information over here. This verbiage is definitely new. A URL, they didn't have that in 1970, as advanced as the Japanese were. Here we have the importer, Tamiya America, Irving, California. Like I said before, during this time, MRC would be the importer for the Tamiya kits. Over here, we have this type of information. The original kits would have a black sticker in this section here with the designation MT and then some type of catalog code. When you see that, you know basically what you have. And right here on this side, we have the other kits that were offered by to me at the time. All of these were again two-way wire remote 
motorized or single motor your motor unit with a simpler box art. But again, all these box arts were just crushing it back then. Here we have the Sheridan, the M42 Duster, M41 Walker Bulldog, Panther Alf A, and probably one of the most badass is the Centurion. Also, back to the Lego info, you have the green, the green point, I believe it's a recycling logo for, for Europe, a barcode, and here we have the information like I said before. Also, here goes the date, obviously 2013. You're gonna know if you're getting shafted or not. And these newer kits are made in the Philippines while the original kits were molded in Japan. Also, interesting how they label as cement and paintable belt type tracks. I mean, that's always been the case with these Tamiya models. Okay, with the box top off, here we have the kit's contents, and like I predicted, it is not motorized. No! No! Starting, well, with the rubber band tracks, they are made with the original Tamiya mold, or what they appear to be the original Tamiya mold. They are a single piece. These replicate the Chevron variants of the M60 track. Now these tracks here are going to be considerably dated compared to what we're used to today for both rubber band tracks, but also the type of detailing found on them. This is one of the changes that Tamiya made when they upgraded the kit in the 80s and into the 90s, replaced these with the octagonal pattern track that I mentioned in another video. Now on the inside portion of the track is going to be really noticeably Simplistic compared to again the type of tooling we expect today, but again for this type of kit It's part of the charm because it is a vintage re-release On the inside portion here of the track on the sides you would have some skeletal structure exposed which Holds the rubber track pads in place Here we have the inner track pads and most notably on these old pattern kits the guide horns Well one they are rendered Averagely okay, you could say they do have their basic shape to it, but a little bit on the smaller side But most importantly if you haven't caught this yet You need to really start looking at tanks more in depth the horn is in the center of the link as opposed to the Break point here or I should say the hinging section in the middle as We know on the m60 is just like with the Patton as well as the HVSS Sherman the guide horn would be connected to the connecting rods that are found on the two end connectors that we have here. On the old Tamiya kit, that's just not the case. The material feels just like any other Tamiya rubber track, and it's nice and flexible, which was originally good for its motorizational use, and possibly again. And here we have the runner, and back in 1970, this is what you got. Now, if anyone, in is a fan of the M60, and you're looking at this piece here, something should be off. And if you know what it is, congratulations, you know the tank. In the middle section here of the turret, there is a cutout that is found in the turret casting. And the purpose of this cutout has to do with the driver. When the turret is in its storage mode, it's positioned directly rear of the vehicle. And because of this, you need this cutout just so that the driver can crawl in and out of the vehicle when the turret is in this configuration. And that is not present here, but this was added by Tamiya on their M60 A3 release. Also, another difference between the 1970 tooling and the tooling that came after had to do with the mantlet and the mantlet on the mini turret. On the original Tamiya release, the mantlet did not have the canvas tarpaulin present, and it was bare exposed, which is actually an oddity because most of the M60s you'll see made have that tarpaulin in place. I'm not sure about the the recent releases from AFV Club because I believe they addressed that, but for the longest time, if you wanted to render your M60 without the mantlet, you're basically left trying to find one of these older kits from 1970. Same is also true for the mini turret. The gun can go up and down, as can the main cannon. And here we have the mantlet sans tarpaulin, as well as the version for the cupola. Also on the cupola, you'll notice that it has this little split running down. This is so you could position your figure in the turret without him falling all the way through. This was changed on the later re-release. Here we have the 105mm gun. 
This has basically stayed the same and is present on the other renditions, albeit it's more of an appendix as it's something that you really don't use as they give you another barrel that has the thermal sleeve on it, specifically for the A3. Here you can see the shape and note the mounting points for the grab handles located on the turret. And it, again, it looks the part. Now another difference is with this little tab we have here. On the original releases, you would have the Tamiya logo, and it would say Tamiya Plastic Model Company, and then the bottom says Made in Japan. On this version here, that is just milled away, and it's just bare plastic. And it would also have the date of 1970. On the reverse though, they added some more modern information, saying that it's polystyrene. And we have here a barcode, but the, oddly enough, 1970 to me is still found on only it's on this section of the runner as opposed to the center tab. This runner here contains the wheels. Note that they are the aluminum pattern wheel, which would be appropriate for an M60A1, although steel wheels were still utilized on the vehicle all the way up to the end of its service life. Note the detailing found on the rims. Just like with the other one, they blocked out the original Tamiya Plastic Model Company information. But other than that, the tooling is identical to the old 1970 release. Digging down further takes us to this runner here, which again should look standard for anyone who's built one of these Tamiya kits. Here we have the suspension, namely the torsion bars, the side panels, which get glued to the tub, your tank commander, other odds and ends found on the lower, and your sprockets. Now note the sprockets on this model here are vastly simplistic compared to the ones found on other renditions of both the Tamiya and the Academy kit. However, this, these pieces here are actually still supplied with those models, be it in an appendix form. Note it has the little hex section in the back here because, as we all know, these Tamiya kits were motorized and you would have a little nut which would engage on the sprocket and that's what would prevent from slipping and would drive the track. From the sprockets, take us to the final drive. Note it had that little L slot. This was so that you could insert the gearbox and you can adjust the track tension. But because this model is basically only designed to be static in this release anyhow, they went ahead and blocked that off and just had that little hole for the axle for the sprockets. Here we have the lower hull, and this is basically left absolutely unchanged. And that's not just true for the old version of the Tamiya kit, but literally every single version of the Tamiya M60 kept this exact same form. Here we have the section, which would be the battery tray for the single motor unit, where you would have these dividing bulkhead walls, some electrical prongs, and this here would be your switch, which would descend from the bottom of the hull. We have this section here with these molded rails. These would be for the mounting of the gearbox. Now the thinner section would be for the single motor and the wider portions would be for the dual motor gearbox. This little oval would be for the gearbox mounting fastener where again, you have some adjustability. Then we have these giant open windows that kind of gives you a face. But the windows, I believe, are for the wire, for the two-way wire remotes you exit out of the bottom of the tank so you can drive it. There's also this hole here, which can also be used for that purpose as well. These two ovals, they're still basically a mystery to most people out there, but they have been a bane on the Tamiya kits for basically since 1970. Now on the Academy tooling, it's basically the same, but Academy went ahead and polished the hull by removing all of these sections that we have here. The kit was still able to be motorized and Academy does sell it as a motorized version, so they kept this little slot, but these giant ovals are no longer present on that tooling. Other than that, it's basically the same. I believe also Academy may have deleted the little driver interior section, which you'll see on the next runner. And here's that runner here. Here we have the driver's Interior detailing, it's a bit anemic, but hey, it gives you something. The driver's hatch is able to function, as are, I believe, all of the hatches actually on these old original 1970 pattern kits. Later on, Tamiya would remove this, and on the other versions that came after this, only the bow hatch here would function, and the other two would be glued permanently, either open or closed. This is the 
engine grill. Note the lack of any detailing found on the rear taillights. Tamiya kept this exact same format. In fact, this exact same runner all on their M60 pattern of vehicles. Academy, oddly enough, went ahead and polished this up, giving you the appropriate detailing on these sections. Here we have the Xenon searchlight, which again, still present on the modern tooling, but it gives you a very basic rendition of the Xenon searchlight. Although they don't really tell you or give you the idea to use it on the other kits, even though you actually can, if you know how to put it together. The air filters, these are the A1 pattern. And again, just some more odds and ends. And this runner here comprises of the tart side grab rails as well as the gypsy rack. Now, this would change on the future release of the M60 A3, where these parts were improved and built into the new redesigned turret runner, which we find on the contemporary Tamiya releases. Now, the piece themselves are very similar to what we see today, but the bottom portion has been redesigned. Also, you'll notice something missing. That little square piece of black mesh, which come on these kits and are always a pain to cut and bend to shape, even though you follow the instructions. Yeah, that's not present on this model. That was an addition that was added by Tamiya on first their M60 A3. So on these old kits here, you're gonna have be meshless, which is not hard to solve today with the advent of PE mesh and other sorts of materials along those lines. On the bottom of the box, we have here the poly caps as well as the steel axles. Now the poly caps on the old Tamiya release have their hubcaps built in. And this was something that actually hurt the look of the model because on the real M60, the hubcaps would be attached to the front face of the road wheel. While on this one here, the wheel would spin and the hubcaps would stay static. Why this was a bit of a ding on the kit is because with this design, you do have a gap around the section of the road wheel for just so you have the clearance for the unit to spin. Now this would be kept on the M60 A3, but when Tamiya redesigned the kit their final time in the 1990s, this whole setup was changed and the road wheels would have their hubcaps molded in. But on that release, they were no longer the aluminum pattern road wheels, instead they were the steel wheel variants. This now brings us to the instruction sheet. Now this looks similar to the original, but it's definitely completely new. But they did give it the old look and feel of the original. It looks like a contemporary to me instruction, has the feel of a temporary to me instruction, but it's just surreal working on a vintage tooling model. Now this is something that is has definitely changed. On the old Tamiya kit, you do have to drill these sections out here. Now, on this, they tell you to use a pin vise. A Dremel would work because, you know, this is sane. On the original one, that's not the case. The original one, they, the Tamiya kit gives you, I'm not making this up, a pointed metal rod that you're supposed to heat with a candle and jab into the turret, into these locations here in order to hollow them out. 1970s, were a really fun decade, apparently. <laughs> but they evolved and now tell you to use a pin vise. And that's basically it. The instructions are predominantly, again, it's a Tamiya. So theoretically you should be able to shake the model and everything should go in place. Now the kit does give you two options for the markings. You have here the one with the gold 12, which is on the box art, or they have this other version here with the Griffin. Obviously, it's your choice, to which vehicle you want to render. And here's the model now going through its production phase. Here you can see the lower hull that has its running gear in the process of being completed. You could also see the hull segments that have been glued on. And this is part for the course for the Tamiya, as well as even the Dragon kits for that matter as well. Now you'll notice that there is gonna be some bodywork requ required on these sections here. Again, this is pretty much normal to what you'll expect to see on these kits. Now it's from this point where things are going to change. If you'll notice on this little section over here, this originally was molded close so that you have a hole directly in the center for you to insert a steel rod because the model would normally be static. But 
One of the modifications that are going to be made to this model here involves this magical system. You see, this model here is not being built as a static model. Instead, it is going to be modified to be a motorized kit, basically returning the model back to its original core form. Now, this is not my idea. This was actually the idea of the customer who hired me to build this tank. You see, recently I completed a 135th scale M60A1 rise with the M9 dozer blade build. And on that model, I went ahead and modified the stock kit to be motorized. Well, the customer liked that video so much that he really yearned to have something like that for his own collection. So he went ahead and sent the kit over to me in order to not only build the model to its complete state, but also to motorized convert it. Now, like I said in that other video, of all of the model kits that are on the market right now, probably one of the easiest to motorized convert is the Tamiya M60A1. Like I said earlier, these kits were basically designed from the ground up to be fully functional. This has to do with both the size of the model, but also with the way the build is designed and comes apart. Right here we have the rear power pack. Note the ample amount of clearance in this section over here for the gearbox specifically. And with the way the M60 hull is designed, you don't have really any major seams to give away the purpose of this build. This is true, by the way, for all of these Tamiya tanks, which were released during the same period of time. They really designed these kits pretty well in this regard. Now on the M60, it seals up right here on the front with its knife blade front. And on the back here, with the way the engine deck is designed, you are gonna have a small little seam in this location, but this is as per the real vehicle. And with the little section on the front, the seam is so minute that honestly, you're not really gonna notice it. Now on a vehicle like the M48 Patton, which by the way is similar along the lines of ease of motorization conversion, it's a little bit more noticeable because of this, the shape of the frog nose, but on the 60, that's not the case. Now, in order to motorize convert this kit, so far, the model is just being built directly out of the box. The only modification I made was, at this point here, the deletion of that little piece of plastic, which sealed this section off, making it for static display use. Now, from this point, this is where this unit comes in handy. These gearboxes have been showcased on this channel on several other builds in the past because they are extremely efficient and are also very affordable for doing a conversion like this. The units come in an unassembled state and you basically just follow the instructions and at the end you'll have your twin motor gearbox. Now this gearbox here can be used for motorization conversions like I am here, but this is the type of gearbox that you can actually use to RC convert a small scale model. Since it is dual motor drive, you can go ahead and have a separate electronic speed controller dedicated to each of the motors, which will give you the ability to independently steer each track, thus giving you the ability to drive the model radio controlled. These gearboxes are very durable. The gears are plastic, but they are broad sectional plastic, which is fantastic. They do hold up pretty well. And again, these units have been on the market since about 1995 now and are a really good source to RC or motorize convert your tank model. The only limiting factor, however, is just the cross section and size here of this unit. If you're working on a smaller vehicle like an M113 or an M5 Stewart, this set here is probably not going to work for you. But for the larger size vehicles like the M60, M48, or like the Type 74 that I mentioned in a, another video, this unit here is perfectly suffice for your application. Now, the unit can be configured in one of two ways, actually in more than that, you can have the shaft mounted a little bit higher, but that's not really useful for the tank use. But another way that this unit can be assembled is with a different type of gear ratio. You have two settings, standard and low. Now, I'm yet to build and try the system with the low setting. All of the builds I've done so far have used the standard setting and the speed looks to be very good. So, I, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Now, one thing I do want to point out is with the assembly, you can easily make a mistake. Now, it's one of those things where it is mentioned in the instructions, but it's so tiny that you can possibly miss it when you're just going through the motions and assembling this unit. And I'll show it to you in a second. 
Now the unit in question has to do with this gear and this gear located on these two sides. If you look on the end, you'll see a brass, what looks like a nut, and then on the center, there's a little set screw. Well, if on the instructions, the way this thing is designed is that you only go ahead and mount that set screw in one of these units. The other one is just basically a placeholder and you leave it without the fastener fitted. Now this is absolutely crucial because if you go ahead and add the set screw to that, you're effectively locking this axle as one and the two motors are just going to be spinning the entire unit as one as one assembly. Now this may sound like this will give you more power, but in actuality, you're not. You're, you're actually, the only thing you're doing is putting strain on the gearbox, the drivetrain, and the motors by going with this, and it could just lead to disaster. So don't do that when you're assembling one of these units. You just use the one set screw, and you're good to go. Now, in order to mount it inside of the vehicle, I am going to have to make some modifications to the gearbox itself. You'll notice that the way this is designed, you have these two little wings on either side, and this is so you could bolt this unit to any sort of material, a piece of wood or whatever mounting surface that the builder would have in mind, which is great for that type of an application, but when you're putting inside of a model tank, it's going to be less than ideal. Trying to get this unit inside, you'll notice that it's going to be making contact with these corners here of the hull and it's going to lead to issues. So these wings here are going to be amputated away and then to mount it inside, I'm going to drill a hole directly in the middle here and tap it and that's how this unit is going to be affixed to the hull. Now you have to be very careful with this because you need to get the alignment just right because if the unit is mounted in twisted or cockeyed or possibly even slightly back is going to mess your track tension. So the way I learned how to do this is you want to keep it as dead center to the static location as possible. This will give you the nice track tension that gives you a good overall look and appearance to it, but it's the gearbox is more than capable of being able to propel the track. Okay, now the gearbox at this time has been permanently mounted to the lower hull. The way this is done is with the fasteners that I was mentioning before. Only on this build I did something slightly different. I went ahead and used two fasteners to line it up as opposed to the single fastener which I've used on previous builds. Now these fasteners are kit supplied with the twin motor gearbox so I already basically had everything on hand that I needed. One of these holes, the one here on the top, was actually pre-molded into the lower hull. And the second one I just drilled it once the first hole was used for the pilot fastener. Loctite was utilized just to keep everything in place and to prevent anything from rattling loose. Now here's the gearbox, now fitted. A lot of careful measurements were done, make sure it was nice and even. Now this is one of the best parts about using this system on a vehicle like the M60. is just with the design of the hull, with the engine deck, how it goes up here in the back, it just gives you so much space and it basically clears the extra heft of the gearbox almost perfectly. I just line this up. There you have it. <laughs> it's like it was just meant to be. The pairing of this kit with that gearbox system. Note the drive spindle is basically in the center. It's a little bit to the left of where it was originally, but it should be perfectly suffice for being able to propel this tank and keeping the track tension at a nice constant rate. With the hull basically now wrapped up, the next area to focus on is the bottom portion of the turret. Now, like I showcased before in the unboxing section, on these old vintage Tamiya M60A1 kits, the bottom, which is represented with this older kit over here, is totally flat. There's no little inset over here, like you see on the later re-release versions that Tamiya did in the 1980s. Now, the purpose of this little indent, like I mentioned before, was for clearance for the driver to get in and out of the tank if the turret was located in its travel mode towards the rear. Now, this here is the kit that I'm working on, and you'll notice that I'm going to add this little bit of missing detailing, which will bring up the kit's quality and detailing from the stock original that we have on this side over here. Now, to do the procedure, I went ahead and took this turret, I masked it off, and I actually made a template so I can take this shape, lay it over any sort of old-school Tamiya M6A1, and this will give me the basic shape and location that this piece goes. Now, keep in mind, on the real tank, this is a rough cast textured piece, so the shape can't have some slight deviations to it and still be perfectly suffice. 
I went ahead and cut out this little section, but I left this tang portion and I just bent it inward. Now from here, this is going to give me a good base and skeletal structure in order to add the epoxy work that's going to further flare this in, making it more representable like this version that we have here. And with the model now complete, let's go ahead and start with the model's lower hull and suspension. Starting with the lower hull, the one thing that can be a hurdle on these Tamiya M60A1 kits is with the way the lower hulls are assembled. Keep in mind there are two halves that get glued together in order to achieve the unique shape of the M60 lower hull. This seems to be a common trait done on just about all of the patent series tanks on the market from Dragon to even Revell monogram and I believe even Revell Germany for that matter did a similar format. Because of this you will have a seam that runs along this section over here and it's something that does have to be contended with and since it is a very crucial focal point you do have to pay attention to this to make sure that that seam is fully polished away. Move our way to the row wheels. All of the components assembled basically effortlessly because frankly it is a Tamiya after all. The one thing I do want to point out is with the torsion bars when you assemble the swing arms on this model, there is a little bit of play on exactly what orientation the torsion bars can be set at. Why this is important is because when you're assembling the model, you want to make sure that all of the torsion bars line up. To, and this will prevent any sort of risk of the wheels not being completely true with one another. Other than that, with the road wheels, they're basically, again, totally stock. The way they work on this model is you have the row wheel that slides onto the axle, and then the rubber poly cap has its hub detail face, and that secures everything in place. Everything, you notice, has to spin absolutely freely because this, again, is a motorized model. If the model was static, less importance would be focused on this aspect. In order to allow the wheels to spin absolutely freely, one trick that I do is I do slightly open up the tolerances on these sections over here, namely where the wheel makes contact with the axle as well as with the hub. On my build, since I installed the row wheels at the tail end of the build, the swing arms as well as the inside portion of the wheels themselves do have a couple layers of paint and primer. If you try to assemble the wheels in this format, they will go on but will be a lot more snug compared to what they need to be specifically because the model is motorized. If it was static, obviously this isn't really anything of concern. To open up the tolerances, either with a pin vise or with a needle file, I just very carefully remove the layers of paint, which then allow the wheel to slide on in a much more efficient way, which then will allow it to spin better. A similar procedure was also done to the top three return rollers. Moving to the vehicle's dry sprockets, you'll see that I added the mud slits found on the inner portion here of the hub. These mud slits are a common trait found on the M60 series of dry sprockets. However, it is not an absolute. Like I mentioned in a few of the other M60 builds that I've done, there was at least one subcontractor who were making these parts for the US government under contract that did not add the mud slits to these parts. Because of this, if your M60 does not have the mud slits, it's not necessarily an inaccuracy. The addition of this detail element is really up to the discretion of the builder. While on the sprocket, I want to point out that this kit here utilizes the kit supplied 1970 pattern of Tamiya sprocket. When the M60 kit was redesigned by Tamiya in the mid to late 1980s, the sprocket was one of the areas that the kit was improved upon. Those sprockets are supplied with the other releases of the Tamiya kit. For this model here, this is generally considered to be a ding on these older pattern M60s and normally would be something I would try to source out for a aftermarket replacement. But because this model is motorized, a resin drive sprocket is just not going to be viable for this build, so the stock one was utilized. On a similar note, this takes us to the track. Just like with the sprocket, this kit utilizes the original Tamiya 1970 pattern of M60A1 double chevron track. Like I showed before in the unboxing portion, the track is very simplistic compared to the type of tooling that we expect to see on more contemporary kits of today. However, for the purposes of this build here, the stock tracks are more than adequate. Just like with maybe other 
builds that I've mentioned before, the tracks are painted in basically the same exact format. The rubber pads, which are found on the front, as well as on the inside portion, are made to represent rubber, while the metal bits, which on the M60 track, of course, would be in the center, where the guide horns would be on the interior, as well as the end connectors on the ends, are painted to look like worn metal. If you ever looked at real M60A1s either in the flesh, on display, or find in action photographs of these vehicles, it's not too uncommon to encounter a vehicle with tracks in this type of condition. From the running gear, this now brings us to the front hooks. These are the stock units. However, I went ahead and drilled out the small little portion on the lower portions here of the front tow hook mounts. These holes are found on the real M60 castings and are basically molded into the Timia kit, albeit they're just not in a drilled out format. With the pin vise and an appropriate size bit, I went ahead and just drilled these out. This small little modification is a great way to enhance your stock Timia kit. From the tow hooks, now brings us up to the headlight and the brush guard detailing. These details here are the stock units and nothing really much to talk about there. However, the one modification that I made, and it's a common one that I make in these videos, are the addition of the support struts that are found on either side of the brush guard. These struts are absent on all renditions of the Timia M60A1 kit, as well as the Academy renditions of the M60 kit as well. In order to add the detailing, it's a pretty simple trick. All you need is just a small strip of plastruct angle. You just trim it to the appropriate shape and drop it in place. Once added, it's another way to greatly improve the look of your vehicle. From there, it takes us to the fire extinguisher. This is the stock unit. Nothing much to talk about there. It is a bit simplistic in its overall shape. Tamiya would eventually replace this with a better detailed version on their A3 redesign, but for this kit here, that's just not present. The unit itself is painted in red, which was a common trick found on this pattern vehicle during this era. Moving along to the back portion, takes us to first the rear taillights. These are the stock Tamiya units, and like I mentioned in the other Tamiya M60 videos, are just an amorphous blob with no cat eye detailing present. One quick way to improve the look of it is you simulate the cat's eye by just with a very fine paintbrush, you take a swipe of red paint and you paint the top portions, and then with a swipe of silver paint, you paint the bottoms. By doing this, at quick glance, it looks like that your model here has the correct pattern of cat's eye lenses. And again, it's a really simple way to improve your model without really having to do any sort of scratch building. From there brings us to the mud guards. And this is one bit of detailing that is an iconic and a really cool looking bit of detailing found on the M60 as well as the M48 Patton family of vehicle. And as a modeling standpoint, it is always one of the more trickier bits on this tank. On the real vehicle, the purpose for these guards is that first it gives a little bit more structural support to the rear fenders. But another added benefit is that it gives a little bit of protection to the taillights to prevent any sort of dirt or particulate that can be kicked up by the tracks to cause damage to these sections over here. On the 1970 rendition of the Tamiya kit, this bit of detailing is absent and was never included. Tamiya would eventually tool these components up and supply them with the M60 A3 and A1 re-releases that again came out in the 1980s. Now for the purposes of this build here, these units are a bit problematic. Even on a static rendition of the M60, they were a bit tricky. First, when it comes time for installation, you have to carefully fit them just right and they have a habit of twisting and falling off on you. And these pieces are one of those parts that when you're handling the model, they always seem to be the type of details you accidentally bump or nudge and fall off on you at really impromptu times. On this model here, that problem is magnified because, again, of the motorization aspect. This model, being motorized, has the risk of any dirt and particulate being kicked up by the tracks, can make contact with these sections here and causing them to pop off. Another issue has to do with access to the motor. Because the model is motorized, you do for you know, one reason or another, may have to get access to the gearbox. And to do that, the entire upper plate needs to come off. Obviously, that's a problem because these units tend to be anchored to the top fenders. 
Well, to work around this, I again had to find a source for these details because the kit did not supply them. And they didn't supply them for basically the same reason that I just mentioned, because of the motorization aspect. Well, on this model here, I utilized a brass photo wash set from Edward. The Edward M60A1 detail photo wash set contains these details here, and they are very nicely done. The Edward PE set really does a good job with rendering these pieces, and because they are made out of brass, makes them nice and strong. On the model here, I actually modified the Edward piece slightly to keep the stock Tamiya rear taillights. With the way the Edward kit is designed, you actually replace these all together with a fancy brass box that contains the taillight in it. It's pretty wild the way they want you to put together, but a little overly complex in my opinion. But the guards themselves are perfectly adequate. What I simply did was I amputated the fold sections that need to create this section over here and just simply mounted them directly to the bottom portion of the taillight. The pieces were then bent to shape to fit around the rear fender work and are basically just held in place in one or two locations. They do not physically make contact with the rear fenders. So if you take the top portion off, these two blades stay permanently attached to the lower hull and don't make any contact with them, thus reducing the risk of potential problems with them breaking off. In my opinion, this detail set along with this installation method is a good compromise where you get the appropriate detailing which is required for the M60A1 and it doesn't inhibit in any way the mechanical aspect of this model. Moving up takes us to the rear travel lock, which is a staple bit of equipment on vehicles of this period. And on this kit here, it's built out of the box. And with the way the kit is designed, the unit is fully functional. It flips up and opens up. And yes, you can even use it to store the vehicle in the travel mode. And yes, you can operate or display the model in this format, but if you ever get bored with replicating the stolen M60A1 that was used in that high-speed pursuit in California, you can easily just swing open the travel lock and rotate the turret to its more appropriate location. Moving our way back to the front takes us to the heating exhaust pipe, which is found here on the fender. This is another one of those iconic bits of detailing found on this pattern of vehicle. The stock component was utilized. The only modification that I made was I drilled out the exhaust portion with a pin vise. Again, simple trick to add, helps the look of the build. From there, brings us to the driver section. The hatch is fully functional as per the kit, and I was able to use the little interior detailing that is found in the whole driving section. Of course, this bit of detailing is very simplistic and is mostly useless, which is why Academy themselves dropped it on their kits, but yeah, you know, they, they gave it to me, might as well use it. One thing I want to point out on the hatch itself, this hatch here is the redesigned Timia M60A1 hatch. The original kit hatch was a earlier pattern and replicated more of the type of hatch which was used on the M48 and the original M60. The difference, of course, being is the center. The A1 has this tombstone-shaped protrusion, with its periscope, backup periscope hinge section found here, while the earlier pattern was just a round disc found in the center with, again, a small little hinged periscope section that was found in the center. This, so far from what I've seen, is the only real difference tooling-wise compared between the two renditions of the kit. And is one that actually improves it from the original offering because... Generally, the A1s tend to utilize this hatch design here as opposed to the other one. The hatch itself, again, is fully functional, just slides right into place and then drops right into its home section when you hit that magic sweet spot. Moving rearward to the engine deck, pretty much the remainder of the detailing on this model is mostly stock. The, to me, a kit is pretty good in that regard. Some things to point out, like for instance on the air filter boxes here on the two elbows, I drilled out the bottom portions of the intakes with a pin vise. 
again, just to improve the accuracy a little bit. And I also drilled out the little holes found on these two rear lift hooks that are found on either ends. The holes again are molded in, but they're more of a dimple. So a nice little pass through with a Dremel or a pin vise in this case was more than enough to pull off the procedure. And that now leads us to the turret. So let me go ahead and pop it off just to show the one modification that was made. And here you can see the underside. Now that's fully completed. Like I mentioned before, this section was added because it was absent on the old pattern of Tamiya kit. With all of the bodywork completed, as well as the cast texturing, you can see exactly how much more improved it looks. Oddly enough, what's interesting to point out is that the 172nd scale Ashi kit, I believe, copied this Tamiya kit here because they too made a similar mistake with not including this divot, as well as also the more squared off shape here of the rear portion of the turret, but that's not really important for this video. Along with the added cast texturing on the bottom plate, you'll notice that I continued the texturing all throughout the remainder of the turret's surface. This alone is a fantastic way to improve the accuracy of this model. And in fact, it really does bring it up to a condition where it's very similar to its more modern contemporaries. All of the remaining surfaces were coated with the texturing, not just the turret, but also the mantlet, as well as the cupola that we have here. The remainder of the details on the turret were the stock parts and they were utilized, which include the lift rings, the range finders, as well as the grab handles. The stock jerry can was indeed used and in order to spice it up, all I had to do was really just paint the strap with that green webbing color, which is typically found on vehicles of this period. Apart from that though, some other aftermarket components were added, namely from the brass photo watch set from Edward. You can see that I added the clips for the tow cable mounts. Now the tow cables are not found on this model, nor were they supplied with this kit. I was thinking about adding the actual tow cables themselves, however, I did not have the eyelets required in order to add this detailing. So this model here, like several of the other older rebuilds that I've done in the past, simply just have the clips present without the tow cables mounted. All of the Edward PE was utilized, and the kit does supply you with enough components to equip the whole vehicle. They wrap around this section here, go towards the center portion of the turret, and then it's a mirror image on the reverse side. While on that note, this brings us to the gypsy rack. The gypsy rack is basically half and half. The stock components were utilized and were built out of the box. They assemble pretty easily and are slightly different design compared to the later renditions of the Tamiya M60 kit. However, again, they go together without any problems. Just like with the modern renditions of the kit, however, the inner mesh work is something that can definitely be added. Now on the more recent releases, they give you a little square of photo wedge, or not photo wedge, it's a fiberglass mesh that needs to be trimmed to size and it's always one of the harder things to do on one of these builds. Well, on this vehicle here, since the PE sets came with the gypsy rack mesh work, I might as well incorporate it. And that's exactly what is used on this build. And even with the PE appropriately shaped, just one thing about these M60s, the gypsy rack meshwork has always been a royal pain in the ass. And that's not exclusive to this build as well. I was able to pull it off, but it's something that definitely requires a little bit of patience and a bit of skill in order to achieve. The piece is consisting of two pieces of PE, one long little strip, and the other one is a... It has like half the shape here of the of the gypsy rack, but then it requires you to actually cut away and custom fit and tailor the, the mesh work for your particular build because sometimes they do differ between builds depending how you arrange the rack. This small here, I was able to pull it off and in order to secure the two sections of brass together, I actually soldered them in place, giving you the optimum strength in order to hold them together. Super glue alone, in my opinion, is just not strong enough to secure these pieces where they need to go. 
Obviously, super glue is, however, used to secure the racks to the plastic bits themselves. I was referring to the brass on brass connections. It's best done with solder. Outside of that, I also added the missing detailing of the support straps, which are found on the rear portion of the bin. And these are absent on these first gen 1970 pattern Tamiya kits. On the later re-releases, however, these were present on those portions. Moving upward to the tank's turret, this portion did receive quite a bit of extra modifications. Starting with the antenna base, the kit originally have two small antenna base looking like objects found in these two locations. These pieces aren't really doing you any favors and are really best amputated. The one here in the front was completely deleted, leaving the cover cap in place. And this portion here was also replaced, but I went ahead and replaced it with a bit of detailing. The unit that we have here is actually a resting copy of a mold that I made from the antenna bases that are supplied with the re-release rendition of the M60 from Tamiya. The unit was casted and then directly dropped into place here on this older model. Now you notice on this model here, I did not actually add the antenna wire. This was done by request from the customer. This model here is going to be placed in a small display case, which is typically meant for die cast cars, because of which the height of the plastic case is very close to the model's roof. And if you have the antenna present, it's going to strike the top portion of the case, which normally means you have to bend the wire out of the way. The customer doesn't want to deal with that, so he just simply had me omit the antenna detailing altogether. Keep in mind, this is not, again, necessarily in an accuracy because these antennas can come on and off at a moment's notice. So having the model in this format is not, again, in an accurate rendition. Moving forward to the loader's hatch, one nice feature that these older kits had was that the hatches were fully functional. Granted, the interior detailing is a bit on the dated side, but having the hatch be a functional bit of equipment is definitely something that I enjoy. To improve the hatch, I added this small little grab handle on this section over here. It there was originally one molded in, this was amputated, and a new one was formed on a wire. On the inside, since I had the piece on hand, I added the photo watch detailing piece from the Edward set just to spice the part up a little bit more from its original blank offering. Moving forward takes us to the I believe it's the searchlight guard, and it prevents the machine gun from oversweeping and possibly damaging it if you're firing it. This piece here is a very iconic bit of detailing found on the M60 family as well as the M48, but it is absent on the original 1970 tooling. This component here, just like with the antenna base, is actually a Tamiya copy that I made a mold of. The unit was straight up molded from the Tamiya one, and Cast and rest it and just simply drop directly in place. This obviously greatly helps the look of the model compared to leaving this bit of detailing completely absent. From there brings us to the little socket. This is supplied with the kit. It is molded into the turret, however, which is actually very similar to how it's seen on the real vehicle. In order to have the searchlight wire conduit, I just simply drilled this section out with a pin vise. And then when this searchlight was mounted, a very small piece of wire was added, facilitating that detailing. While on that subject, takes us to the searchlight. This is the stock Tamiya unit. And this unit here was slightly modified from its original offering. On the searchlight, there are these little grab panels that emerge from the side, and these are present on the Tamiya original. However, they are molded in and are a bit chunky with their, with their overall look. For the model, I just simply amputated and sanded away the original sections and replace them with new handles fabricated out of wire. These help the look of the piece and really make it shine from the original. Interestingly enough, on the Tamiya M48A3 kit, they took this overall design of tooling and enhanced it further, and that kit actually has a pretty decent searchlight for a base starter kit. On the inside, you'll notice that I painted it like you've seen on several of my other Dragon builds, where the rear portion of the searchlight is painted in silver. The bulb, however, the back portion is black along with the inside wall sections from the remainder of the searchlight. On the face, I added a clear plastic lens. This is not present on this pattern of the Tamiya kit, 
and it's something that really needs to be added if you're going to model yours with the search light. On the lens itself, you notice I painted a little red trim around the edge, and this is found on the search lights. I believe it might be the sealant used to keep the inside moisture proof. From there, it takes to the barrel, totally stock, nothing really much to talk about. It is a two-piece assembly, which means there is a, a bit of a seam work that you have to contend with. Nothing too egregious, just a little bit of polishing with some sandpaper and a needle file was all that was required to bring it up to the condition that you see it here. Moving along takes to the cupola slash mini turret, which is an iconic bit of detailing on the M60. The main gun itself can go up and down, which is a unique feature found on the 1970 pattern of Tamiya kit. As we all know, on the re-release, this was changed where there's that claw tarpaulin that's molded in. The barrel was modified where I drilled out the vents found on the barrel sleeve. This is a very tricky procedure to make, and if you don't have the experience or the tooling, you, want, you definitely want to avoid that because you could just lead to issues. I had that small little hole in this section over here, which was absent. And the remainder of the detailing that was added were the three lift hooks found on these three sections. One thing I want to point out is that on this rendition, I kept the hinge with its stock format, which is inaccurate. It's a ding on this older kit. The M60's hinge is slightly different from the way you see it in this configuration. However, the one plus is that the hatch is fully functional and opens up to the way you see it here. There is no other interior detailing found on this component, however. But for the nostalgic feel that the customer requested for this build, I think he's going to be more than happy that I kept it with its stock hinge work. From there brings us to the paint and the marking. For the OD, I went with my standard 1960s, 1970s dark olive drab that was weathered to the condition that you see it here. The markings are the kit supply decals and was again the decal set that the owner requested. The quality of the decals are exquisite. They are the exact same pattern as the ones found on the original, but are printed in modern printing machines with modern stock and decal material. Because of that, the decals are 100% problem free. They apply and lacquer on like a dream. Absolutely no problems are encountered whatsoever. And if you're building one of these kits for yourself, rest assured that the decals are definitely not gonna give you any issues. However, I do wanna point out one aspect of the markings that did trigger my OCD. And that is the bumper code found on the storage bins. This is a common location where these are found on this pattern of vehicle. And here we have the US Army ID with the actual serial number. But on the opposite side, they are on opposite ends. This is not a mistake and was specifically requested for you to make by the Tamiya instructions. So I went, I followed the instructions literally to the T as per the client's request. It's one of those weird quirks that is found on one of the vehicles marked in this configuration. Well, normally at this point in the video, I'd start winding it down. However, because this model is motorized, I'm obligated to take it out for a test spin. In order to get access to the batteries, we need to first take off the turret. Simple enough. This model here is powered by two AA batteries in this little convenient battery pack. In order to get access to the pack, I just lift up on this red wire here and the unit comes out. In order to stuff the battery pack in, it's a little tricky, but it just fits directly in place. Keep in mind when you do this, the front likes to pop off sometimes. So after you're done securing the batteries in place, just make sure the front is just give it a little pinch over here just to make sure that the poly cap is engaging it. Secure the tart back in place. There we go. All right, now on the bottom of the hull is where the switch is. Now notice on this model here, I did not make any other modifications or additions to the lower hull, cutting away sections to make do for the switch. In fact, I actually recycled the original switch hole found on the model. It's a bit of an homage, I guess, to the original kit. On this model here, the switch is internal, and you can see it through this section here in the light. Notice we have this red dot over here. This is to indicate which way to put the switch into the on position. Now this model only has a one directional switch, which was requested by the customer. 
it can only go in the forward direction unless you put the batteries in in reverse to which then the model will go in the opposite direction but normally this model here is a forward only model well let's go ahead and fire this one up careful how you hold it because you don't want to hold on to the tracks while you turn the tank on she's alive Well, there you go. Like I said before, these to me at dual motor gearboxes never disappoint and are fantastic ways to get your static tank into a running status. They are powerful, they have a decent speed to them, and what's cool about this tank here, it even has that M60 track squeak, which is a nice little touch. In the end, I'm really happy on how this build turned out. Working on one of these older Timia kits is always a joy, and to bring it back to its core original form, i.e. making it motorized, was definitely something that I had a lot of enjoyment in undertaking. And that basically now segues us into skill level and recommendation. For skill level wise, this model here is definitely something that a beginner can easily put together. These model kits here are very simplistic and with this early rendition of the M60 is arguably even easier to put together than the other Tamiya and Academy M60s that are on the market. Those kits are in themselves somewhat very easily assembled kits, but this one here is even simpler. Outside of a beginner, an intermediate builder can also definitely tackle one of these kits. However, from anyone who is from an intermediate and up, honestly, you're probably going to find this kit to be very boring. Because of the simplistic detailing that's found on this model, along with many of the inaccuracies that are present on this older kit, someone who's an intermediate or advanced builder may not necessarily find something like this to be very desirable. Instead, I would strongly recommend looking elsewhere for the other more recent renditions of the M60A1 kits that have been produced over the years, be it from Academy, Tamiya, or the Cadillac of the bunch, the kits from AFV Club. Although, if you are an advanced skill builder and like to tinker with improving plastic model kits and are looking for something that's a little bit of a challenge, perhaps one of these kits here might be something to look into. One advantage that the Tamiya Pattern M60A1 kit has is that there is a humongous infrastructure of aftermarket detail components that are available. From components that are made in cast resin to photo etch, even replacement suspension components all can be had. However, of course, you don't want to go too off the deep end on something like that because at the end of the day, with the amount of money and work you're going to pump into it, it's really still going to come in, in my opinion, still slightly below the other kits that I just mentioned before. So this, of course, is up to the builder's discretion. But if you do have a spare parts been filled with spare M60 PE or resin parts on hand from past builds that didn't get used, and you're looking for a build to pump them into, perhaps one of these older kits here might be something, again, of interest. And while on that note, we basically just transitioned into recommendations. 
This model here is strongly recommended for anybody who is an avid fan of the M60 family, as well as the Patton family in general. On a similar note, this kit here is strongly recommended for anybody who is a fan of collecting Tamiya model kits. Just like I mentioned on the Tamiya Vintage Panther A build that I did a few videos ago, this kit here would be recommended for anyone who is looking to get back into modeling. If you're the type of person who used to do a lot of builds in your youth, possibly one of these kits here was one of those kits that you built back in the day, but you're looking to just get back into the armor modeling hobby for one reason or another, these kits here are very forgiving and it's a good way to pick up exactly where you left off. Although realistically this kit here was, is really meant for someone who is more or less a collector or like to cl build retro kits and but don't want to fork over the money for an original, another spot where this kit actually does have some relevance is with, oddly enough, anyone who's looking to RC or motorize convert a 135th scale plastic tank kit. You see, with the other more advanced kits on the market, namely the kits from Dragon, TACOM, or AFV Club, although detail-wise they are out of this world and are absolutely amazing, those kits, however, are intended from the ground up to be built as static display models, and they do a phenomenal job at that. However, there are a community of individuals out there, specifically on YouTube, if you search for them, you'll definitely find them, who like to take static plastic 135th scale kits and make them functional. Well, with this kit over here, it's more easily done compared to the other models. Because the original Tamiya kit was designed from the get-go to be fully operational and motorized, for an individual who, he's, who's really good at working with small electronics, this kit here to RC Convert is going to be a much better candidate compared to something like a TACOM. Because of the stock kit's very simplistic detailing, this would lend itself to being a very efficient RC tank. With the simplistic detailing, this now reduces the risk of having fine detail parts break off during the model's operation. Of course, when you start adding detailing to an operational model, the fragility and frailness goes up, thus the risk of breaking parts. Now, of course, on this model here, I tend to lean on the more detail aspect of models. So this model does have some extra detail parts fitted, which again is something that any of the individuals I'm talking about can easily make to it. But there's one other advantage that this particular kit has over the other Tamiya and Academy renditions that came after the release from this one. This advantage has to do with the gun mantlet. You see, when the Tamiya M60A1 kit was redesigned, they went ahead and redesigned the molds of the turret, giving the gun its cloth tarplin found on the mantlet. When this was done, the ability to elevate and depress the gun were eliminated. This also carried over into the Academy renditions of the kit. You see, the Tamiya 1970 pattern of the M60A1 kit was the only one to still feature the ability to raise and depress the gun. With this feature, this would make it a really good candidate for a, a mini RC tank person to make the turret not only rotate, but to have the gun be able to fully elevate and depress via an RC function. This is definitely an advantage that this old kit has compared to the other counterparts. Alas, from here the tank is going to be packaged up and shipped along with the display case and the original box to the collector who will probably put it on display in his model tank collection. Probably right beside the other M60A1 that I built for him. Although unlike that tank, if he desires to or has the need, can take this one out and put some laps around his living room with it. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale vintage Tamiya M60A1 main battle tank. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content, being small scale model showcase videos like this guy over here, or the other larger project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in the loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. 
There, I have more photographs of this particular build, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been posted in the channel in the past. Finally, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Till next time, take care. Huh. Well, let's see now. The video's done, the photography's done, the pictures are up on Facebook, and the video is live on YouTube. Well, I guess all that remains now is to box it up and send it off to the customer. Huh. That's a real pity. Two bags. I really did like this one. I should have built one just like it. I mean, identical to this one with maybe one or two small differences to it. Hmm. Oh, wait. <laughs> That's right. I did.